Hey there, it's me again, the Grey Man, and it's Friday, so it's time for me to go through some of my birthday books. So here we go, we've got Ghostly Tales from the Haunted House, number 75, Jimmy Olsen, Superman's Pal, number 123, and number one of Tower of Shadows from Marvel Comics. Right, these three, all from September 1969, which is when I was born, uh, cover dated September 1969, I hasten to add, not um, release date, because I've only got a different release date than they have cover date, I'm aware of that, but uh, yeah, no, I, I go with the cover date ones, because uh, yeah, it's got September 1969 on my birth certificate, and these have got September 1969 on their covers, so that's the same, that's the same difference. Right, so let's start off with Ghostly Tales from the Haunted House. Uh, I never had any chart on books before I sort of bought these birthday books, and uh, they're not too bad. They're, they're, they're kind of like a poorer quality. You can tell they're kind of like poor cousin to, to DC and Marvel, just the stapling, like sort of the way it's stuck in the side of the of the comic instead of like in, in the spine. It's just like it's sort of nipped in the side there. Uh, <clears throat> when I first saw them, I thought they were bloody... Uh, there's free staples as well. But when I first saw them, I thought they were... Yeah, it'd been restapled or something, but apparently that's what they're all like. Anyway, so we got this um, ghost host, whatever he is, kind of like a demon kind of thing. Doesn't actually seem to have a name. I never actually saw a name for him. But anyway, this is title page. He's just introducing the three stories that are going to be coming up on this comic. I think I might zoom in a little bit if I can. Actually, that's a little bit better, isn't it? Right. So we've got no other man. Phantom Patrol and Last Voyage in this here this here book. Right, starting off with Phantom Patrol. Uh, if you've been checking out my channel, you might have seen my Halloween um, ghost stories that I did, and this was one of them that featured in this. It's uh, it's kind of a story you've seen quite a lot or heard quite a lot about. Basically, ghost soldiers. This soldier is uh, in the middle of a barrage, and someone calls him into a foxhole. The guy in the foxhole tells him, you know, send go go, go back to the base. Send artillery to this position here. This position where we are, you know, say, make the bombs fall here. Uh, art by San Ho Kim. It's the first time I actually counted his work. Actually, he's not too bad. Uh, Korean guy, I believe, did a heck of a lot of work. I actually read into his uh, bio a little bit on Wikipedia just for you know, just some extra research. That doesn't help me with this video, but it was just something cool to to read up for myself. Anyway, so he managed to escape from the from the the, you know, the action at the front line. Goes to to base. Tells them the, 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 what the guy in the uh, foxhole told him told, you know, to bomb that position. But he said, well, whatever you do, don't bomb that position because you'll kill them. They're better off to be you know, captured or whatever than to be killed by our own guns. But this guy just immediately orders them to fire. And he's like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. You're going to kill our own men. And he goes, look, come with me. Let me show you this. And he shows him like a, a packed up belongings of like a dead soldier. And that's the, the guy in the trench. That's his belongings being about to be sent back, shipped back home because uh, he's dead and he tells a story of what they, they figure happened he'd only just arrived at the front uh, was, was taken up positions or whatever and suddenly they were ambushed ambushed and killed and then a few days later well, this is only, obviously only what they're imagining but a few days later the spirits of the dead men get up and you know carry on the fight basically so what they do they, they march around until they encounter enemies and once the enemies fire at them they go to, they go to ground wait till some other allied soldier comes up orders them to drop fire on their position, so thus taking out you know the enemies that are nearby, obviously not doing them any harm because they're ghosts. But then it says, it wasn't too much later that the war was over, Traitor went home, the officer went home, but the Phantom Patrol is still there, watching and waiting, waiting and watching. And yeah, there you go. I did that as one of my Halloween uh, videos. If you haven't checked out my 30 nights of Halloween yet, they could all do with some more views, you know. Some of them had less than 30 views, which is uh, which is not good, guys. Come, give us a, give us a hand. 
Watch those if you haven't already. <laughs> right, then we go on to the last voyage. This one was a bit confusing to start off with. Right, Paul Dubois from Marseille is in a stinking tropical port on a mission. But up until this moment, he hasn't found anyone to help him reach the man who sent him that mysterious letter halfway around the world. A stranger moments ago came to Paul Dumas in the foggy darkness and told him to seek out Captain Nielsen on the waterfront. So that's what he's done. This is Paul Dumas. He's, he's come to the, the this Captain Nielsen, takes him on board his ship. He can't see the crew. He said, he says, oh, it's foggy. You can't see the crew because it's foggy. And then he takes him and down, you know, downstairs to the whatever the part, the captain's cabin, whatever. They have a drink, but it looks like his uh, drink's been um, tampered with because he wakes up. He's, he, he feels the growth on his beard. He feels he's been growing for three days. So he's been asleep. His, his watch has stopped. So that means he hasn't been wound up for forty-eight hours. So he doesn't actually he doesn't actually confront Newton about it immediately, but he says, uh, I, de I demand to know where we are and what is happening. The idea was that this Newton was going to take him to this to an island uh, where they, this person who wrote the letter was. can't remember the name of the person who wrote him the letter. But yeah, it was all a bit confusing. I mean, it's an uh, invisible crewman. You think to frighten me because I didn't see someone at the helm? You wish to look at Alaska? Very well, Dumas, look. And he sort of hoves into a view. So he's basically got a ghost crew. Right, so he takes him to this island where this blonde guy is, uh, Giles Lassoire. And it turns out this Giles Lassoire and his crew were responsible for the deaths of Captain Newton and his crew. So as punishment, he took him to this island that only he can get to, shrouded in darkness and fog. And he um, abandoned him there, basically. Uh, assuming he's a, he can, assuming he's got enough food to eat. But uh, yes, yeah, so he's abandoned him on this island all alone as punishment for killing his crew. But before he, he uh, abandoned him, he let him have a letter delivered. So he gave him a letter to send to this guy. So he makes sure that the letter was delivered. And then he's responsible for bringing this guy back to the island. Right, but then he remarks that both of them... Captain Newton knows these two men well. Lassoir, who had slain a friend to steal a fortune, and Paul Dumas, a deserter from the army, a thief and a traitor to his country. Now each of them has a plan. I know that Paul Dumas plans to kill Lassoir and take his fortune. I questioned him why he babbled from the medicine I placed in his wine. But what are Lassoir's plans? And so he takes, Lassoir takes, um, I can't remember his bloody name again already, but uh, Dumas into his cabin, the captain stays outside, and he do some. He does some spell. In the darkness without end, a man's very soul may fly from his body, and another man's soul may take its place. The word Lugarati Hosna Mimushan will cause the transference of one body from another. Hosnam! That's all right, it didn't happen to me, that's cool. I was just a bit worried then that my body might suddenly start transferring into another body, but it's okay, I'm, I'm fine. Anyway, so yeah... <laughs> So then it gets a bit confused, could be confusing or sorry. So then it looks like um, it's either Matt, yeah. So the, the soul of the guy who's trapped on the island, um, Lassoir, is supposed to have seemingly have entered the body of Dumas. So he's going, he's got his treasure with him, whatever, he knows where his treasure is. So he's going to leave. So he, leave, he leaves the island on the boat of Captain Newton. Um, yeah, it's confusing. Then he says, Dumas, well, it's the soir in Dumas's body, I assumed, says, this is the last voyage, let's go. It is over. The crew waves as the man Paul Dumas leaves the ship in a moment. And at the end, he says here, the night is ended. Dumas planned to, st planned to steal Le Soir's money and Le Soir schemed to take Dumas's body. Luckily, I was present to prevent these two dreadful crimes. I, Cyrus Nielsen, took what they both sought, the living man's form and the other man's money. So, yeah, while he thought that he was stealing his body, I don't know what happened to his soul, but it's not in Dumas's body because Newton's soul has gone into Dumas's body. And then he took the money that was, I assume, sitting on the island somewhere. So he's got... He's got the Soir's money, and he's got um, Dumas's body, and he's no longer a ghost. So he's deserted. he's left his, his ghost ship behind him and his crew. I suppose that's what they, they, that was all about. It was a little bit confusing, right? And then this is more like a, a historical look at the 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 uh, nights of the year, the chivalrous times of World War One, when the the pilots had a code of honour. The um, the Red Baron, for example, who would. Uh, like it, one of his enemies' guns were jammed. So uh, it's certainly in those early days of aerial warfare, he set a code of sports stream sheet that was to distinguish his record. Once he had the famous RFC ace Billy Bishop in his sights, but because Bishop's guns were jammed, the Red Baron smiled and flew away, leaving Bishop to fight another day. Yeah, so that was the kind of thing that he did back then. But then it says, 
Uh, yeah, and that, that guy that he, he spared, he, had, he, went on, he went on to put, drop, I don't know, was it? Uh, 72 enemy machines he took he put down uh, like, and then it was talking about uh, as war dragged on a heavy weariness set in sportsmanship retreated before an urgency to win the enemy was no longer to be saluted but to be eliminated the kill became all important decency was expendable yeah and then uh, Baron von Victor died April 21st 1918 chivalry within the flying circus was in its death throes and he was overtaken he was sort of the Red Knight's command fell to a young officer who flew an all-white Fokker D7 and was destined to, destined to wage terror against civilians and cities at another time in another war. His name, Hermann Goring. The ghost of the god Mars is still laughing. Yeah, that's, the, uh, that's what that was about. So just like a little historical kind of thing. Um, right, and no other man. Right, so this woman's... Uh, why her husband has died, but she's found another guy, another suitor, who looks very much like her husband. Isn't this strange? Your late lamented husband was born in the same month and year as I was. Really? You're very much like him, Mr. Sissonby. In fact, you'll be his twin if your nose was straighter. And yeah, so basically, you can see the ghost of her ex husband there. And uh, she's she's basically getting a replacement, but not just a replacement in looks. She, you know, she tends to make him a, an actual total replacement by usurping his soul. But she she reasons with it that he's a money grabber, and um, you know, he was after her cash. So she, as far as he's, she's concerned, you know, it's, you know, there's no moral quandary about it. She's quite happy to have his soul usurped by her ex-husband's. She makes him get a nose job. There's a couple of things about him, uh, a little bit annoying to her, but she's waiting for his soul to be bumped out and her husband's soul to come in. Um, he even gets him to change his name. <laughs> Why don't you change your name legally? I'll get your name legally changed. <laughs> to Roger Wim, which is her old husband's name. Then if you and I, if we, you know, I wouldn't even have to get a new driver's licence. Sounds reasonable, I guess. <laughs> so she basically turns this, this guy who looks like her husband into a perfect copy of her husband. Then she has a, a husband's soul fly into his body. <laughs> Sorry about this, Sis and B. You'll have to get out of your shell. There isn't room for both of us. No, no, I won't leave. I won't let you do it. Stop. It isn't right. If you were an honest, decent person, we wouldn't have been able to do this to you, Sis and B. Get out. What a cruel fate that these two should find happiness through such foul deeds. But stay, have they found happiness? Look at lovely Letitia. What's wrong, my darling? I'm just as I always was, aren't I? No, you sniff, just as Sisson be. Your ears are wriggling right now. You're not really my Roger, are you? It will never be the same. I can never walk, be happy with you, you swaggering, ear wriggling sniffer. <laughs> I'd forgotten how insufferably weak minded you could be at times. And then the demon ghost at the end says, Well, we've got another unhappy ending on our hands, but that's life and death too, apparently. So there you go. <laughs> uh, Sisson B gets forced out of his own body. And uh, yeah, and it doesn't have a happy ending for the, the, the husband and wife. And then we've got a nice batch of uh, cool old style adverts on the back here. I saw a really cool advert in the back of Brave and a Bowl 100. To, but you know, you get the, the ones about muscles, about increasing your muscles and being, the, you know, being tough guy or whatever. This one was about your height. It was literally claiming it could let you grow, like, I don't know, up to three inches taller or something like that. <laughs> How they got away with that rubbish. Right, this is uh, my very first copy I've ever owned of Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Uh, it was quite kind of, uh, I'd actually said that, I think I might have bought one going cheap actually. So yeah, this is my second ever. <laughs> right, yeah, it's an interesting title. I was surprised it ran for so long. I'm not sure when it started, but this is number 123. And this is back in 1969. So that's like 10 years, 1959 then, isn't it? Easily 1959. Uh, yeah. yeah, it must be 1959, I think, because it's uh, 12 issues a year, isn't it? So that's 10 years. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how long you run for after this, but Jimmy will live in that cage for one year to pay for a horrible deed I did. Make him come out, Superman. He's my son. Sorry, Mr. Olsen, but he's vowed to take your punishment. The sacrifice of Jimmy Olsen.
Right now, I think Jimmy was also always an orphan, yeah, an orphan since boyhood. Gallant, devil may care, Jimmy Olsen has practically raised himself. Now, when Jimmy has become famous as a star reporter and Superman's best pal, suddenly out of the forgotten past comes a mystery man who claims to be Jimmy's father and who confesses to a dreadful crime. Impossible? Jimmy doesn't think so, and he's determined to take the rap for his dad and make the sacrifice of Jimmy Olsen. Yeah, so that's just like, you know, they always have like a like a jump forward kind of panel before it goes back and tells you the story. So this is him. Yeah. All right, Dad, I'm ready to take your place in the glass cage. I bought this statuette to remind me of Superman. Choke. I won't see him for a whole year. So I don't see what crime is actually committed. It's not a crime he's actually um, properly uh, trying to atone for. He's not gone to jail. He just voluntarily locked himself up in a glass cage. Uh, in his own mansion kind of thing. And this tells a story of how uh, Jimmy thought that his father had died in a train crash. Uh, but apparently he hadn't died all his time. And suddenly, suddenly he's able to, to contact his son. To Jimmy, from your closest friend on earth. Happy birthday. Oh, that's just, just a letter from Superman there. Yeah, I think it's actually just his, his birthday. Yeah, and he's, someone sent a car for him. It's Mark Olsen, his father, who happens to have a massive mansion. It's like, if he's known... I mean, surely he must have known about him before. Yeah, I've, I've, it's been a while since I read this one. I did have a quick flick through. But, uh, yeah. So, anyway, he goes to his mansion. He's got a massive estate. He must have, he must have been able to check the, uh, you know, what happened to his son. But maybe that will come up in the next issue, because this, this one doesn't get fully finished in this one. So he's, he's a self-imposed prisoner in a glass cage, basically. Um, he says he looks like him. He looks exactly like me, like the father I always dreamed of having. But I'm, I'm, I reckon in the next issue he's going to turn out not to be his dad because surely he's got all this money. He could have made a darn sight better effort to find him. Uh, you know. <laughs> I don't think he goes into how he uh, survived the train crash either. But anyway, uh, come in here, son. I'll give you all the answers. Incredible, young Olsen is the first person the master ever allowed inside those glass walls. First, I'll switch off this microphone and only your ears can hear the whole ghastly story. Yeah, and that's it. So you don't hear, you don't hear what happened. You don't hear what happened, what the story is, what crime he's meant to have committed. So, and then basically he says, okay, I'll, what I'll do, because he, he's, he's vowed to spend a year in, in this glass case as a penance, a self-imposed penance, basically. And for some reason, Jimmy Olsen decides to do it for him, which is a crazy notion. Like, if he's doing it like a penance, you can't, someone else can't do your penance for you, can they? Um, and it's not like it's um, been imposed by the government or anything. It's not like a, a proper judgment. It's a self-imposed penance. But, uh, yeah, anyway. But anyway, so Superman hasn't seen um, uh, Jimmy for a while. And then Jimmy sig signals him and he explains to him what's happening. You won't see me for a year because uh, I'm going to be in this cage to, uh, to for his crime that my father committed. Uh, yeah. And he's, so he flies off Superman. Sure, Jimmy, what evil did Mark Olsen commit? What crime is Jimmy taking the rap for? That's a good question, Superman, but you and our readers will have to wait till the next issue of Jimmy Olsen for the astounding answer. I've got to say, I am kind of intrigued. <laughs> it does make you think about buying the, uh, the next issue just to find out. Right, then we've got another story here. I think this, this second story is bigger than the first story, actually. Uh, the Robber Robot. So, uh, Jimmy gets given a robot, basically. His car is uh, a bit of a scrap heap, but he goes to this place... And they give him a robot. Basically, it's, I think it's a, a guy that he did a report on and um, made him look bad in this report. So this guy wants to get his revenge. So he, he gives him what he says is a robot, but he's actually a guy dressed up in a robot suit. So this guy's they, they want to embarrass him now. They want to embarrass him because he's going to be going on a talk show. And they want to reveal him on the talk show as not being a robot, but a man in a suit. And like, ha ha, Jimmy Olsen is so silly, he thought I was a robot. What a, what a burk. That kind of thing. Uh, but the, the robot kind of gives itself away a little bit by doing silly things like, uh, I think it steals a car at one point. <laughs> yeah, it steals a car here. It, it always wants to break into a, a shop to steal some jewellery because it thinks its master wants it, even though it's just a bloke in a suit. I think he, uh, yeah, I think he drugged him, actually. Yeah, and the bloke takes the thing off his head to uh, 
get some food and water. Uh, now I think there's something to do with the fact that when he tested the water, I don't know, he did so he did it differently, and that's how Jimmy knew that he wasn't a robot because the way he tested the water made him realise he wasn't really a robot. Right, then he's going to go on Jimmy Carson, Johnny Carson's show. Jimmy Olsen's going to go on a Johnny Carson show, The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Uh, and the robot's going to be there with him as well. Right. But then he turns the towels on him. Talk, cause he went on there saying, oh yeah, uh, I'm sure you've all seen robots before, but the one I'm about to show you is so fantastic you'd almost think he was human. And that's when he takes off his, his mask to show that he's not a robot at all, but he's a human. And he's like, haha, Jimmy's gonna be so embarrassed when he finds out. The crowd are saying, hey, something's wrong with the robot. He's lifting his head, look what's under it. Look, the robot, it isn't a robot, and Jimmy's still talking. This robot can do any job a man is able to perform. He can read, write, talk, and is equally dexterous with both hands. He needs no sleep, food, or drink. Someday, robots like this one will take their place in our society, relieving man of all dull and tedious labour. And people are looking, oh, Olsen doesn't realise it yet, what a fool. He must have been duped, how dumb. And then he says, oh, I see you've noticed that fellow behind me. He is not a robot, you're right, he's a phony, but... I am Jimmy's amazing robot. I walk, talk and move just like the real article. I was a gift Superman gave Jimmy on his 21st birthday. <laughs> so there you go. So the tails are turned on the guy who was trying to make him look silly and he even points him out in the audience. Professor Robert Harker, who tried to perpetrate this hoax. Thanks, Prof. It's been fun. <laughs> and then this is, uh, you sure fooled everybody, Jimmy, especially Harker, but how did you catch on? He says, simple. I saw the robot feeling the temperature of the water of his hand when he drew with my bath. A natural reflex for a man, but not for an unfeeling robot. And that's how he managed to work out that he was being fooled. Uh, yeah. And he put his robot in his place. Well, oh, this one, I don't remember reading this one. Uh, <laughs> right, so he's meeting up with his fan club, the Jimmy Olsen fan club. He's, he's wearing a costume given to him by Superman, exact replica of Superman's costume. He's talking about the importance of observation. Yeah, he was kidnapped one day and made to look like he was um, in a spaceship. But he, he observes the outside and realises it. There was an old movie set and he wasn't really uh, blasted off into space. It was only a fake. <laughs> uh, and uh, what tipped you to that the capsule was a phony? The model of Earth was hanging in blue space. Whoever rigged it up didn't know that space beyond our atmosphere is black. There you go, it's a bit of a tenuous... Uh, right. Also, if it had been space when I got up, I'd have risen to the ceiling because I'd have been weightless. Yep, yeah, fair enough, good call. Uh, another time I was summoned to the lab of a man who called himself Professor Collins. Yeah, and he's showing him he's got some device that he claims can look into the past and sort of remote view of different things from around the world. Joel is speaking Kryptonese, all right? With this invention, you really go places, Prof. Name you to jail. That movie scene, the newsreel clip of Ike's Parade, and the Kryptonian film you stole from the Superman Museum were clever, but not clever enough. How did you know? Simple, a machine that caught light waves from the past couldn't capture sound waves at the same time because light travels at blah, blah speed per second and sound moves at blah, blah feet per second. Yeah, so basically. And then uh, let's see how observant you fans are. Since I arrived here, I told you one lie. What is it? And the lie turns out to be that it's not an exact replica of the Superman suit uh, because the S is backwards, or the, the colours are the wrong way around. The S on his shirt is yellow on a red background, just the opposite of the Superman's emblem, which is red on yellow. So there you go. That's an observation thing for you. Did you realise that, children? <laughs> and there's a few pages of ads and letters at the end. Right, finally we have Tower of Shadows, a Marvel book. This is number one. Features the debut of Digger, who is the, uh, the, the book's host. So Tower of Shadows, tales to blow your mind at the stroke of midnight. So the first story, these people have inherited this house at the stroke of midnight. They're searching through the house, trying to find, uh, it's written and illustrated by Steranko, this one. Lots of small panels in this book, very crazy sort of layout. Very unusual. I don't know if it's experimental or there was other books that went a lot like this. But yeah, very, look at how many panels are on that page. So basically they're looking for the wealth inside this house. They, they've, they've inherited the house from an uncle or something like that. Um, they're a bit bitchy to each other. She's The, the woman's very money-grabbing, calls him a spineless worm. Uh, and then 
they see a po- the portrait, which you see from the cover here, and it appears to point down the hallway to, to where the treasure is, to where, to where he kept all his stuff. So they go down to the doorway, manage to get their way inside. It's a look. He studied witchcraft. Look at this one about finding a path through time itself. And Mary, let's get out before it's too late. All this stuff, the books, please, I, I... Shut up, not till we find the money. It's my, our future. We'll be on Easy Street. It's here, I know. Help me move the clock. So they move the clock and they find a passage. Right, walking down the passageway, they, 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 they... And she says, get hold of yourself. How you ever had the backbone to give him a shove and push him off the cliff, I'll never know. So we see that they actually killed him to inherit his money. So she's all happy. She's found his worldly goods and chattels, whatever. And then they carry on looking... Uh, the path uncle was seeking, the pathway to the past. He found it. He found it. And they see that the they've, they've by going down that passageway, they've, they've, they've ended up in the French Revolution period. And, uh, yeah, they're rich. They've got all this riches dripping off them, like a king and queen. And there's the baying masses of Le Revolution. On. <laughs> yeah. Uh, liberty, egality, and whatever else it is. <laughs> Fraternity, is it? I'm not sure. And the executioner is like, I think that is actually him. Yeah, he's actually him. He's he's the one they kill, or his ghost has gone back in time, and uh, he's beckoning from the guillotine, saying, "Come over here." <laughs> yeah, come over here. I want to get a head or a couple of heads in this case. Right, and there's Digger. Too bad about those two, isn't it? But that's what they get for losing their heads over money that way. You run along now. That's enough stories for one night. And old Digger's got work to do. What kind of work? Don't ask. Believe me, don't ask. Yeah, he was a grave digger, so <laughs> I'm sure it was digging work. Right, then this one is um, about a, an investigator. Not, he um, basically finds frauds in the medium kind of community. He goes around from seances to seances, trying to find out, you know, what, what, how they're trying to hoodwink and dupe people. He's got another guy with him who's like writing a book about him, basically a kind of reporter, writing a book about all these discoveries he's made, all these um, times he's gone to, to, to spirit mediums and, and uh, debunked, debunked their fake claims kind of thing. Um, and then he goes to this new spiritualist. Uh, I'm Arthur Watson. I'm to meet Mr. Hathaway. I know, come in. Mr. Hathaway has just arrived. We've been waiting for you. Right, and she starts to her, her doings. Um, he's looking out for, trying to show what kind of claptrap they're, they're making up. Uh, all these spirits come out. She claims to be tired from calling the spirits. He obviously doesn't believe it. Starts searching, searching to find that she's a liar. He's, he's breaking the walls to see where the projector is. He's checking for false buttons and, and you know, things that make noises to, to fool people into thinking that yeah, there are spirits around. But then finally he realises that she's true. She's telling the truth. And that's when she's, you know... You know, don't you? You know everything. You know why I've made a career of exposing false mediums and phony spiritualists. Yes, I know. The spirits have told me. Long ago have they told me. You have been searching, searching for a true medium. Searching for someone who could truly communicate with the dead. Searching for someone who can pass through the doorway to the world beyond and who can bring others through that doorway. Searching because Hayden Hathaway died many years ago and you, his spirit, have been roaming the earth, restlessly seeking that doorway and peace. Yes, yes. And Madame Angelica takes him through to the spirit world, leaving the reporter, the bloke writing the book, Arthur Watson, behind. And he's like, now, Arthur Watson, you slump against the shattered wall, your body quaking, your hair whitened by shock, sobbing, mumbling sounds lost deep in your throat, and at your feet are strewn the crumpled pages of a manuscript that can never be written. For who would believe? Who would believe? Well, that's the tail end of my little tale, but as they say in the movies, I'll be seance you. Till then, pleasant dreams, you pale-looking pilgrim, you. <laughs> right, and then this last one is one that I featured in my, my Halloween, 30 Nights of Halloween. Um, there's this Arthur. No, Arthur is like the, the mute uh, assistant of this um, this guy here. I uh, can't remember what this guy's name is, but he's looking for the secret of eternal life. Everlasting life he's looking for. This is a Stan Lee story with art by John Bushima. Um Yeah, but he's a horrible old man. He's like... Yeah, you can see he's, he's 
bad tempered. He berates his he berates Arthur all the time. But Arthur is biding his time. Arthur is wait. You just wait. Once you've found this this secret of eternal life, I'm gonna pinch it off you, and uh, you know I'll I'll live eternally. You know, and uh, I'll I'll make sure you have a sticky ending. And finally, he works out what it is. He 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 has an epiphany how to do it. He studies the oldest animals, works out how to get their you know, their basic essence. And um, eventually thinks, well, you know, turtles live for a century, but that's not enough. A redwood tree, it lives virtually forever. So somehow he's able to steal from the sap, the secret of eternal life. Just as he's about to, to take, partake of it, Arthur finally goes, right, that's it, that's mine. Thank you, old man, I'm having that. He, he knocks him to the ground, takes the potion for himself. Uh, you revel in the fact that he is dying just as you are about to gain eternal life. He lets him die. Uh, but then it, the, there's a twist in the towel. He gets eternal life, or as life as a redwood. You feel new life, limitless life surging through your body, and you know the potion works. You will live as long as a redwood. But it's a pity you never suspected the reason they live so long, Arthur. You see, they use up almost no energy, for as anyone knows, a redwood never moves. Lucky for Arthur, Sebastian had an antidote in his po for the potion, but how will he get it from a dead man? If you can think of anything, let him know. But take your time, my friend. He won't be going anywhere. Now, one of my housemates is um, uh, a healer. She does like spiritual healing kind of thing, or, or I don't know what the actual term is, but she does like these hands-on kind of healing thing. And she was she, she's a student of it anyway, and she wanted to practice it with uh, me the other day as a as a as a subject. So she was saying, put your you know, rest your feet flat on the ground. Imagine that your your feet are sinking into the ground, and the you know, roots are coming out of you, and you're drawing up energy from the ground. And I was picturing this scene. I was picturing this. Where I was like trying to envisage the the you know that <laughs> just a little bit of maybe of interest to people. I don't know. Right, and that's it. That's the story. Few adverts, but I don't think this title ran for very long actually. But Digger did go on, um, not as a major uh, character, but I'm pretty sure he fought Captain America at some point. I actually went through my Captain America books just recently. I didn't remember seeing the title, but I'm pretty sure he did fight Captain America. A, a team called the the Night Squad or something like that, led by the Shroud. He had Dance Macabre in it. He had the Brothers Grimm in it, and he was in it as well. Anyway, that's it. I'm really out of battery, so I've got to rush. Right, who can I tag in this week's video? I'll tag Metarog. Why not? Everyone knows Metarog anyway. They should do any because uh, you know you've got a great channel, lots of awesome stuff in there. And let's tag um, Five as Revenge again, because I can't think of any of the channels that I watch. I'm terrible, I'm always watching them, but when it comes to try and remember, I need to make a note of who I'm going to tag before I start the video. Right, so yeah, make sure you add these guys' channels if you haven't already, because they're cool.